Murray, the defendant, and all counsel. Mr. Nurmi, you may continue with cross-examination. <clears throat> Detective, this hearing on August 29th, um, who is representing the state at that hearing? 29th or August 7th? Is that the one you're talking about? August 7th. I'm sorry if I said another date. I apologize. August 7th, 2009. Who is representing the state? I believe it was Mr. Bias. Goes to motive and bias. Uh, overruled. Jimmy, answer. You may. Who was the prosecutor? Who represented the state that hearing? It was Mr. Martinez. Okay. And earlier you testified that you said it was a, a misunderstanding or your mistake. Uh, your testimony that day was a mistake, right? No, my testimony was a mistake. Uh, the portion of sequencing was a misunderstanding I had with Dr. Horn. Okay. Well. You were asked some pretty specific questions. You were asked if it was Dr. Horn's opinion that this rendered the victim unconscious or did he still remain conscious? That's a pretty specific question, right? Yes. And you answered, he said it would have rendered, possibly rendered the victim unconscious, but definitely could have been conscious, correct? Yes. Okay. You also said, or you were asked, but in the circumstance based on all the other injuries, it was his opinion that it did not re render him unconscious, correct? Yes. Okay. And you say that you misunderstood that, you misunderstood Dr. Horn. That's your testimony here today, right? In the conversation I had with him prior to that hearing, I had spoken to him regarding uh, the anguish, the amount of pain, the well, suffering that, that Travis would have gone through that I'm day. I'm going to object. It's non-responsive and 403. Sustained. 
Can you repeat the question? I'm asking that you're claiming that what you said in that was a misunderstanding of Dr. Horn's, con your conversation with Dr. Horn. Yes. That's what it was. Okay. Yes. And, you know, we've seen uh, Ms. Arias uh, have interviews on television. You gave one as well, didn't you? Yes, I did. Okay. And do you recall who that was for? I believe it was CBS. Okay. And my recollection, you would probably know better than I, but that appeared to be a pretty lengthy interview. Is that correct? Um, uh, hour or so, maybe? Over an hour, yeah? Yes. Okay. And in that particular occasion, uh, you offered the same theory that Mr. Alexander had been shot first. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. And you did that on a couple of different occasions. Is that right? Yes, that's what I believed. Okay. And so, but this was based on your misunderstanding, Dr. Horn. That's what you're telling us, right? Yes. Okay. And so you repeated this misunderstanding. You put this misunderstanding first in your police report, right? Yes. And second time, under oath and giving sworn testimony, you perpetrated the same misunderstanding. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then again, you did it uh, while being interviewed on national television. Is that correct? Yes, that's what I believed. Okay. Thank you, Detective. Redirect. Sir, with regard to the police report uh, that was shown to you in terms of the sequencing of the shots, take a look at it again and see whether or not anywhere in Exhibit 290, starting with DA00018 and then going to the previous page, which is 17, whether or not you ever indicate a sequencing of injuries, ever. No. It doesn't indicate that, does it? No, it does not. In fact, with regard to that, do you talk about the wound that the victim received? Yes or no? Yes, I do. Do you talk about the lacerations and the puncture wounds and the length that they might be? Yes. Do you talk about whether or not there was stippling to those wounds? Yes. Do you talk about a report uh, as to which injuries may have been fatal or not? Yes. Do you also talk about the knife wounds in the back and how far they went in? Yes, I did. Do you talk about whether or not those were fatal? Yes. Do you talk about whether or not the victim had any defensive wounds to him? Yes. Do you talk about whether or not he attempted to protect himself during the attack? I did. Do you talk about whether the Fatal wounds consistent of stab wounds to the center of the chest. Did you talk about that? Yes. Did you talk about um, what damage that wound caused? Yes, I did. And did you talk about whether or not the wound to the throat was fatal? Yes. And then you also talked about the manner of death, whatever that may have been, right? Correct. Anywhere there, do you talk about any sequencing at all? There's no sequencing in there at all. And this was written when? Why don't you tell me again when this was written? It was written in August of that year. 2008? Yes. Why don't you just take a look at it and see what date it was actually written? It was written and submitted on August 27th of 2008 at 4.29 p.m. And nowhere do you indicate any sequencing, do you? No. Do you ever indicate anywhere here <coughs> that Dr. Horn said, or gave you a sequencing of events? No. Or injuries, I'm sorry, do you? No. With regard to Exhibit 260, that was a hearing in which you testified at, correct? Yes, it was. It was under oath, wasn't it? Yes. Prior to that hearing, did you speak to Dr. Horn? Yes, the day prior. With regard to speaking to Dr. Horn, did you speak to him about 
any potential suffering by the victim. That was the main focus. Overruled to that question. With regard to that particular conversation that you had. And the defense attorney, was it somebody else at that time? Yes. And yes, yes it was. And there was more than one, wasn't there? Yes. And with regard to that, you were asked about Dr. Horn. He did, and the question was, he did indicate that he was not certain as to which came first, correct? Correct. And you were asked as to which injuries the belief was came first. Do you remember being asked that? Yes. And do you remember then that the defense attorneys objected because you didn't know what you were talking about? Do you remember that? Objection relevant. Ruled. Do you remember them objecting to foundation because you didn't know what you were talking about? Yes, I do remember that. Are you a medical doctor? No, I'm not. But you were allowed to testify anyway, right? Yes. Because of the type of hearing that it was, wasn't it? Yes. And was it your understanding, just your understanding, that whether or not hearsay was allowed at that hearing? Objection to also legal conclusion. Question was his understanding? His understanding. Overruled. Yes. And could you tell us what you thought Dr. Horn had said? I thought Dr. Horn. Yeah, but you, you could tell us what you thought Dr. Horn said, right? Yes. And you told us what you thought he said, right? I did. Were you correct? No, I was not. And with regard to the opinion that you gave, prior to giving that opinion, did you, you know who Lisa Perry is, don't you? Yes. Who is she? Uh, she works for the Mace Police Department lab. And Lisa Perry, did you talk to her before rendering that opinion back in August of, uh, what was it, 2009? Yes. Did you talk to her? Uh, I talked to her on many occasions, yes. But did you talk to her in anticipation of that hearing? Yes. And did you, did she give you any opinions that you incorporated? Yes or no? Um, yes, a few. And still you went ahead with what you thought was your opinion, right? Yes. And your opinion was based on conversations with Dr. Horn. That, those conversations with Dr. Horn, were they recorded? No, they were not. And were they in person or telephonic? Telephonic. And the, and the majority of the time, what, were, what was the subject area that you were spent talking about? The suffering of the victim. Did he ever write anything to you, giving you the sequence of events? No, he never did. Did you ever see anything written by him indicating anything of the sequencing of events? No. So the bottom line, that information that you gave, whose opinion was it? Was it yours or Dr. Horn's? It was my opinion. I don't have anything else. Can you approach on? You may. Are there any questions from the jury for this witness? You may step down. The state may call its next witness.
Can you spell your first and last name? Jody, J-O-D-I, leg, L-E-G-G. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please walk around and have a seat. Your name, please? Jody Legg. And who do you work for? I work for the city of Mesa, Crime Lab. What do you do there at the uh, Crime Lab? I'm a forensic scientist three. I work in the biology department. And uh, what do you do there in the biology department? I specifically analyze um, evidence for the presence of DNA, hopes to get a, a DNA profile. One of the things that uh, we learned earlier today is that um, there's a screener that's involved. Are, you know what a screener is, correct? Yes. What is a screener? Well, are you the same thing as a screener? Um, when we say screener, the, another term for that is serologist. Right. And the screener or the serologist is the person that actually um, looks at the evidence up front and decides what areas to swab or to cut in order to send through to DNA. And so prior to moving on to DNA, you would be trained, all people would be trained as a serologist. And so yes, I am a screener and a DNA analyst. How does your job differ from that of a screener? My job as a DNA analyst, I accept the evidence from the screener and then perform DNA analysis on the, that particular item. I don't necessarily look at each item and decide what area to cut or swap. What, um, what, uh, what is your educational background, for example, your college background, and then we'll talk a little bit about your training. I have a Bachelor of Science degree from SLU in Louisiana. I have numerous classes in chemistry and biology, postgraduate level and um, in-house training and external training. How long have you been in the position that you're in where you actually conduct DNA testing? I have been with the city of Mesa since 2004. Prior to that, I have 15 years of experience as a um, research chemist, not in a forensics field. And uh, with regard to DNA, um, I think we sort of know what that is, but what is DNA? What, first of all, what does it stand for? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, it's actually the genetic information that is held inside our, our cells, in the nuclei of the cells. It comes from our mother and father, it's inherited. And, well, my question is this, everyone has this DNA. Correct? Everyone has DNA. And uh, just by way of illustration only, doesn't everybody have, for example, one hand, two arms, two legs, that sort of thing, two eyes and a nose and a mouth, right? Correct. For the most part, all of us are um, very much alike. There's only a very small portion of our DNA that is completely unique to us. So I guess what I'm asking is, the type of work that you do, what is it that you do that allows you to, for example, differentiate the biological substance from somebody, from that of somebody else, if most of the DNA is the same? Um, the specific locations that we look at in forensic DNA analysis are locations that would be specific to an individual. So those are the ones that, if you look at, they're the ones that differentiate that indiv individuals amongst ourselves, is that how it works? Those are the very low percentage of um, locations that are differentiated. And if you want to, once you do this process, um, what does the result look like? Is it a graph that goes up and down? Is it numbers? Is it in writing? Exactly what is it that is the end result of, uh, of uh, the examination? You will have a graphic representation and numbers. So you'll have peaks with numbers underneath. With regard to the peaks and the numbers underneath, are you the one that actually um, interprets the peaks or is that just automatically done by a machine? The instrumentation will provide the, the graphs for you, then the analyst looks at it and compares it to known graphs and numbers to, to decide if there's a match or not. And what area of, we're looking at chromosomes, right? Correct. Certain areas. How many areas of the chromosome do we look at? Um, 16 different locations. All right. Do you also look at the sex marker, as they call it? Yes, it's called amylogenin. Is that included in the 16 or is that 16 plus one? It's included in. So you look at the sex marker and then you look at 16 locations, is that right? The sex marker plus 15 others. Right. I see. And 
if you look at location one, whatever that may be, and you get a, the results, are the results numerical? Um, can they be numerical? They can be numerical. So is, when there's a, do you know what a profile is? Yes, a profile would be the compilation of the, the numbers attributed to the peaks. And so you look at, for example, the 15, do uh, you know what the word loci is? Mm -hmm. What is that? Locations on the chromosome. And so you look at these locations, and then you get one number, or what is it that you get? You can get one or two numbers if it's a single individual. Each of us, um, like I said, we get the um, DNA from our parents, one from our mother, and one from our father. So if your mother and father have the same, you may have one peak, but otherwise you can have two peaks. So a single profile, you'll have no more than two. A mixture of more than per you would have three or more. Let's say that the contribution from the mother is a 12. Let's just pick that number. Okay. And the contribution from the father is a 12. You still report both locations, though, right? Correct, but you'd only see a single peak. Right, and it's still the same number, but it's still you do report the two locations. Though. That's correct. So that if you get a full profile at each location, each location has two readings, correct? Two numbers. Two numbers associated with it. One associated with mom and one associated with the dad, right? Correct. And this profile or these numbers are then compared to the other profiles to see if there's a match, right? That's correct. And so what we're talking about is a matching of numbers. Exactly. And if, for example, at one of the areas, one of the loci, there is not a match, let's say that instead of a 12 and 12, and everything else matches, you have a 12 and 13, is that a match, sort of a match, or not, or, or not at all? Um, it depends on if there's any other information available in the graphical representation. How about if you get two of them that are not the same? 12 and 12 of one, and the person that you're looking at is a 12 and a 13, and the other place is a 13 and 13, and the result is a 13 and a 14. Do you know what an exclusion is? If, if, if there is no other numbers or peaks present and a known sample is, say, a 12, 13, and then your graphical representation in the numbers was, say, a 13, 14, then it would be a no match. The person would be excluded. In, in real life, I mean, obviously, we don't get um, a situation where you could always get one pristine sample of the unknown and then... Uh, because people are always touching things and that sort of thing. Uh, what's that called? What, what happens if more than one person touches it, say two people? You would end up with what's known as a mixture of DNA. Even though it's a mixture, are you then able to still tell whether or not it's a match to one person, two people? Can you still do that? Yes, you can. In this case, how many known samples were submitted to you for comparison? The names, if you will. You have I had two samples submitted. Um, well, no, not samples, but known. In other words, do you know what a buckle swab is? Two buckle swabs were so, submitted. So only two buckle swabs of known people were submitted? Correct. Nobody. Okay. Who were they of? One was of Jody Arias and one was of Travis Alexander. And with regard to Jody Arias, did you develop this profile? Yes. And with regard to Mr. Alexander, did you develop this profile? Yes. Did you look at the profiles between the two of them to see if they matched each other? They did not match each other. So, so far, so good, right? Yes. And in terms of the crime scene, did you receive a item that was purportedly near a wall, item 77 is what it was, um, for you to take a look at and submit it and check to see whether or not there was any DNA and whether or not you could develop a profile? I received a swab from the wall. All right. And were you able to develop a profile? Was there, first of all, was there any biological substance in there? There was biological substance in that a profile was developed. I'm sorry, I didn't get the last part of my hearing. A profile was developed. Okay. And that profile, tell me about that profile. It was a mixture of DNA. And this mixture of DNA, the, the, this mixture profile, were you then able to compare it, for example, to... Travis Alexander's profile. Yes. And when you did that, what, was, what were the results? The, the mixture turned out to be um, the major contributor to the... Let, the, let me stop you there. What do you mean when you say major contributor? When you have a mixture of DNA, we were talking about earlier that you can have a graphical representation with peaks, 
you can look at it and see which peaks are larger. You, you're able to determine who gave more DNA to the profile than another. So a major profile can be um, picked out. Right. That major profile um, matched Jody Arias. Okay. The remaining, what we would call a minor profile, the lesser contributor, matched Travis Alexander. All right. So what does it mean that a person's a major contributor in terms of the quantity, I guess, of DNA since we're talking major and minor? The quantity are, you would assume that the quantity was higher because the peaks are larger for that contribution. But was there a result at every one of the low side for Travis Alexander? Was there no. A, so what does that mean that there wasn't a result at all of the low side? It just means that there was not enough DNA present to develop a full profile. Was there um, a full profile, enough DNA from Jody Arias to have a full, if you will, profile? No. And so there was not a full, pro full profile for him, not a full profile for her, correct? That's correct. But even though that's there, was there, were there any exclusions? In other words, could Jody Arias be excluded? No. Could Mr. Alexander be excluded? No. So what is your opinion, I guess? That's my opinion is that both of them were present in the profile. And the biological substance that was submitted, was it blood or do you know? I don't know. You just know that it's some it's biological, a biological material. Right. How about with regard to the uh, hair? Uh, was, did you have anything to do with the root of a hair? There was um, two pieces of hair that were submitted. Okay. One of the pieces contained a root, uh -huh. and the second piece was further up on the hair. So a hair, I, I believe it was a um, length of hair that was cut with one portion containing a root, and then the next portion was that piece right adjacent to it. With regard to the, this hair, um, do you know whether or not it was item number six from the scene? I don't know. We have property ID numbers that I deal with in the lab that are different than the item numbers at the scene. Do, do you have any description on your report that indicates what number they may have been out at the scene? It would have been a, a 39 something. Can I refer to my sure, report? Sure, please I can give go you ahead. Do you want just that one? I'm so sorry. It would be item number 392692-A. But you don't know what item number it was out at the scene then? I do not, I'm sorry. Okay. But you did do a hair, right? Yes. And in terms of the actual hair part, not the root, were you able to get a result? Not the root? Not the root. Okay, the, the hair was cut into two sections. So the part that did not contain the root, there was a profile developed that matched Travis Alexander. The portion of the hair that did contain the root um, matched to Jody Arias. So explain to me what we have here in terms of the part of the hair that matched Mr. Alexander. What are we talking about there? There was um, biological material on top of the hair. With a hair and DNA analysis, um, you need a root material to do what's known as nuclear DNA. Our DNA is housed in the nucleus of the cells. And so for hair, if, if I pull my hair out and the root is present on the end of it, I can get a DNA profile from that root material, from that, that end only. If I go further up into the hair, you know, and just take, you know, a broken off piece that's just the shaft of the hair, there is no nuclei in that section. And so the two different sections are cut to say, okay, the root comes from this particular um, donor of a profile and the next area of it, I can tell what is the, who does the substrate on, or the substance on top of the hair belong to. So the substance on top of this hair that you examine, the profile matched who? 
Travis Alexander. How about the root? Who did that match? The root matched Jody Arias. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Cross examination. Chairman, we have no questions from the court. Any questions from the jury for this witness? I see no hands. You may step down. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take the recess for the weekend. We will see you on Monday, 1030 a.m. Please arrive by 1025. Remember the admonition. Are there any questions? Have a nice weekend. You are excused.